So uh, my name is Mike Furlow. I'm the executive director from Hathi Trust, and welcome to this session on the Hathi Trust Research Center. Um, the subtitle, It Takes a Village, clearly indicates that this presentation was proposed before November 8th. Um, uh, you may recall a book from the 90s, yeah, falls flat. Librarians don't remember books. Uh, so anyway, my name is Mike Furlow again, and uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a tag team presentation this morning and then some moderated discussion. So I'm gonna start us off, and then we will uh, follow up. You'll hear from Beth Playley, who's immediately to my left from Indiana University of Bloomington. She is the co-director of the Hathi Trust Research Center. Then on her left, Stephen Downey from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Stephen is also uh, co-director of the research center. To his left is John Unsworth, now Dean of Libraries at the University of Virginia, uh, and uh, part of the executive uh, management group for the research center. And then on the far end, we have Robert McDonald from Indiana and uh, Beth Namachavaya from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. They're gonna moderate the discussion at the very end uh, of this session. We, we, we decided we would split the speaker fee multiple ways here uh, so that we could uh, each give each some something for Christmas. Um, so I will start off uh, with a little bit of background about Hathi Trust and then leading into the research center. The first thing I want to do, I always want to do, is remind people that as much as you think of and as we know of Hathi Trust as a digital library, as a collection of, of, of a large number of digitized books online, it is first and foremost primarily an organization uh, that is co-owned and co-operated by its members. There are 120 members in Hathi Trust, nearly all of them in North America and most of those in the United States, but not exclusively. And our role is really a library mission, right? It's the mission to collect and preserve cultural and scholarly heritage for future generations. Uh, so at the core of what we do is digital preservation. That's absolutely the basis of it. Uh, but Based on that mission and based on that core activity and the aggregation of content that we've been able to accumulate over the last eight to 10 years, uh, we are able to launch and, and, and uh, move forward with a number of other cooperative programs, a, number of ra a range of programs. The Hathi Trust Research Center is just one of them. A couple I will mention but not go into detail are distributed copyright reviews, right? So among our membership, there are about 20 institutions where staff are looking at the copyright renewal and registration information for works in our collection to determine if they can be opened. Uh, there is a program underway to establish a shared print network among Hathi Trust members to ensure that for all the digitized collection, there are print copies retained and disclosed as being retained. And that we have collection development programs, especially around federal documents right now. So the, the real power of what we do is not necessarily in providing access, which is valuable and critical, but the power I think of it as really being able to harness the membership uh, for, these, for these other programs that really can transform how libraries operate. And, and because we are so large, because we have so many members, one real value that I have for the organization and that the organization has is to draw on the distributed strength and expertise of the membership. That, uh, and not to assume that it's something that could or should only be located at one place, but a, a set of programs that can be operated at multiple locations. So while I am an employee of the University of Michigan and the University of Michigan provides the host, administrative hosting and infrastructure hosting for the research for the preservation and access repository, uh, there is a mirror site for the preservation repository at Indiana University. Uh, there is a metadata management system that's developed and operated by California Digital Library on behalf of Hathi Trust, and the research center itself is co-located at the University of Illinois and uh, at Indiana University. So um, I will, as I said, we'll just be talking primarily about the research center in, in, in today's session. Now on this point of the collection, I talked a little bit about how it's not enough just to focus on the collection. I think because what we're going to be doing today is talking about making computational access available to this collection, I wanted to talk for a minute about its characteristics. So the collection today is just under 15 million volumes. Um, uh, I, was hope, I was hoping to get to 15 million by, the, by this meeting, but I blame someone who shall remain nameless for not getting their content in, uh, in, time, to, in time for us to celebrate that. But still, let's just call it 15 million for, for giggles. Uh, that equates to about 7.4 million unique book titles 
Uh, that uniqueness is based on mark cataloging, so your mileage may vary on how many titles we actually have. Uh, and within that, that accounts for about 5.2 billion pages, digitized pages in the collection. Now, of the collection, about 40%, usually it's ranging between 39 and 40% of the collection is open and available for reading. That means it's either public domain or has been licensed for, for open access. The collection is primarily books. The focus of the collection will remain for the foreseeable future, primarily digitized or digital books and serials, published works. Um, but it is not the case that the collection excludes rare books, special collections. I mean, it's actually a pretty wide range of material that's in, in Hathi Trust. However, um, not surprisingly, the majority of the collection probably comes from the 20th century, and the majority of the collection, as you just saw, is, uh, is in copyright. Um, the, uh, the, the collection, this bar graph is trying to give you that picture of date distribution, right? Publication, date, date distribution. And then the orange tips on the gray cigarettes here, it's not like a cigarette with this on fire at the end. Uh, it's, uh, those are actually, the orange tips indicate how much of that decade's output are open in Hathi Trust, okay? So not surprising here for a collection that's, that's based on digitized works from research library collections in North America, the large majority of this comes from the second half of the 20th century. So a quick comment on the kinds of access that we provide. Uh, first on, uh, let's call it human access or reading access. Uh, we, uh, it's always confusing to people and there's often misinformation about what exactly we provide access to in the collection. So I wanna just quickly clear that up. Uh, one thing we do is provide full search, full text search, as well as bibliographic search of the collection to anybody anywhere in the world. Okay, so the entire collection is available for search. Um, the entire collection is also available for data mining and computational analysis, and we'll talk more about that as uh, the morning goes on. And the entire collection that is open that is public domain, out of copyright, or Creative Commons license is available for reading to any individual without regard to whether they're at a member institution or not, okay? There are some caveats on that. If a work is not out of copyright in your country, you won't be able to read it in your country, okay? So if the work is public domain in the United States but not elsewhere in the world, then you should only be able to read it in the United States. If it's public domain outside the world, outside the rest of the world but not in the U.S., we can't see it here in the U.S., and there are some, some several thousand titles like that. Then uh, for members, members do have some additional access privileges there so they can download those works in full. Uh, the, uh, the most, I think, the, probably the service I am most proud of of all the things that we do is making available the entire collection, uh, regardless of copyright status, to users who are blind or print disabled at member institutions, right? So if anyone on your campus has a need for a library book that's in Hathi Trust and they are eligible according to uh, US law or the law of your country, uh, if you're a member, then we can uh, work it out so that they can have access to materials in the collection. And we have also announced this year a partnership with the National Federation of the Blind to expand that access in the US. Uh, so more on that will be forthcoming. And then the last service around reading access is just replacement access. Preservation replacement copies can be made available for works that you have that have gone lost, missing, damaged, otherwise unusable, and are no longer available on the market in a new condition to to quote the US Copyright Act. But what we're gonna talk about today is this lovely, uh, uh, previously foreign phrase to me, non-consumptive research, a phrase that I'm not sure really existed or was certainly not in popular parlance in the United States until the Google Book Settlement in the last decade. Uh, the, the Google Book Settlement, you might recall, there was uh, Google said we're going to scan everything. Everybody freaked out. Um, certain of those, everybody sued Google. Um, and uh, the authors and the publishers uh, got together and worked with Google to arrange a proposed settlement for their lawsuits. And that went through a couple of rounds of hearings and uh, freaking out, and ultimately that settlement was rejected. But within that proposed settlement, there was the concept for enabling non-consumptive research on the corpus of materials that Google was digitizing. And that proposal is, uh, in part, the genesis of the Hathi Trust Research Center. The idea was that there would be multiple, at least two, research centers. Uh, there would be one at an academic institution. And this phrase, non-consumptive research, which essentially means not humans doing stuff on the texts, 
uh, regardless, you know, without having to have reading access, comes from this Google Book settlement. And what's interesting here is this phrasing, it comes from that time, but as, as the folks up here will be able to tell you, in order to actually run the research center, offer services, develop the protocols and the processes, it's really necessary to think through this phrase and think through what it means and what it means to enable that non-consumptive research on material that should not be redistributed uh, because it is in copyright, right? So we'll talk a lot about that, about that challenge this morning. So in order to fulfill that non-consumptive uh, access role, one thing that we do at Hathi Trust is distribute data sets. So if a researcher needs access to data, they want to run the computes in their own environment because they, they need that kind of control, that's feasible, but we only distribute data if it is uh, out of copyright uh, or public domain uh, or Creative Commons to, to do so. And there's two different data sets we class in there. One is uh, non-Google digitized, about a half a million, maybe almost 600,000 volumes. Uh, and then there's a set that's been Google, uh, digitized by Google. Um, that one I call out separately because in order to gain access to it, Google does ask institutions to sign an agreement basically acknowledging that they're receiving stuff that is uh, in copyright and, and it's for use in non-commercial purposes. So in planning our research center, as I said a few minutes ago, this kind of partly came out of the Google Book settlement. So we first started talking about that way back in 2008, which was when Hathi Trust was founded. If anything, we were talking about it before Hathi Trust was officially launched. Um, in 2009, a group of uh, staff from Hathi Trust and other partner institutions put together a proposal for a research center at, uh, uh, hosted by Hathi Trust. It was submitted to the Hathi Trust equivalent of their board of directors at that time. Uh, and they approved that, and based on that, there was an RFP for hosting of a research center among the Hathi Trust membership. That was in 2010. And uh, two proposals from Indiana and Illinois were received uh, to propose to co-host the research center, and based on those proposals, the award was made to Illinois and Indiana. So I'm gonna stop with this. I wanted to lead us through this history of what we do at Hathi Trust, some basics, and then into how we got to the launch of HTRC. And I'm gonna turn it over to Beth Playley, who's gonna provide some more background on the research center itself and services there. So. Great, good morning, everyone. So the... Uh, it's, it's, not, it's nice, nice to be here uh, this close to Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> uh, so the Hathi Trust Research Center is um, kind of, I think, contributing to the overall mission of Hathi Trust in, in several ways. Uh, I think the most well-known contribution that we bring is uh, grappling with the problem of how one enables text, data, data mining, text mining over a set of content that's very large, 5.2 billion pages is large, as well as restricted, you know, 60% of the, of the content is in public domain. So how do you enable that kind of, of, of interaction by researchers um, in a way that doesn't impede their, their research pr processes but yet protects the data as it needs to be protected. So I think that that's been a, a sizable contribution of ours. We do this as um, you know, as user driven as as we can, because part of it is we're pushing the community to think about analysis, you know, uh, digital humanities being an example of community, we're pushing a community with capability that they've not really had before. So we're trying to stimulate their understanding of what these questions are while getting feedback from them so that the development that we do can be user-driven uh, development. So uh, we do this through reviews and user studies, but we also do it through things like the vignettes that are sitting up here that some of you may have already <laughs> seen that give examples of, of people who have already defined research questions over large, large sets of, of content. Uh, and then again, we build tools, and this this again is a collaboration across um, you know, Indiana University, Illinois, and Hathi Trust. Uh, the last couple years have been good years for us. We've seen uh, substantial growth in in terms of um, uh, people who are engaging 
with the, the, the products of the um, Honey Trust Research Center. Uh, 923 new users. We have a total of uh, over 1,000 registered users. Um, a smaller number of data capsule users. I'll show you what the data capsule is in just a moment. And a total of 257 institutions represented amongst our, uh, the, the user community. So the way I like to characterize this um, is, is through this, uh, the, this cartoon diagram. When, when a researcher comes to, uh, to the Hathi Trust Research Center, um, and, and the question that they ask is that of, well, which, which of the modes of interaction of HTRC are best for my needs? And we characterize that into three types of offerings. Um, and I would point out that the fact that we're on a slope here from left to right, a downward slope from left to right, is, is very intentional. I'll come back to that. So in the upper left-hand corner, we've got extracted features. Extracted features are, are pulled out of the content of the books, packaged up in a way that it can be taken, uh, downloaded, and analyzed at a researcher's institution. Oh, my. Hold on here, I didn't see this. Hopefully. OK, that the, that the, the anal analysis can, can be done. <laughs> Hold on. I hope that works. OK, the analysis can be done at the user's, um, um, inst at the researcher's institution. The kinds of content in the extracted feature are parts of speech, word counts, and, and, and whatnot. Um, the middle piece is. Uh, the portal, uh, you know, our web tools, the user logs into a web interface, and here the access is to things like uh, canned analysis tools. And then finally on the right-hand side is uh, some, you know, so where the middle is canned analysis tools, the right-hand side is my analysis tools. So, you know, I don't want to necessarily use a canned algorithm, so I want to use my own algorithms, and I want to apply those directly against the data. And the data capsule, provides a protected environment that allows that. So the reason for the slope is, you know, as you go from the upper left to the lower right, you get closer to the data, and because of that, more restrictions kick in. So the data capsule is, first of all, it's closer to the, um, you know, it's closer to a, a virtual machine um, that one has to be more technically astute to use and it also ha it's also a little harder to use because here again, the closer you are to the data, the more protection mechanisms have to kick in. So that is, so this is how we're, how we're characterizing it. And, and there's one notion I want to bring out here also, and that is when you go from your own desktop, which is the extracted features on the left-hand side, to the other modes, which is the middle mode of the web tools and the right mode of data capsules, there is a, um, a something we call a work set that represents what you're doing. A work set captures both the, the content over which your analysis is going to be done, and it's really that research life cycle all the way to the published product is that work set. So the work set isn't needed for extracted features because you're doing everything at your desktop. But when you start to work in an environment that's not your environment, that work set has to kick in because that work set represents the researcher in, a, in that remote setting, that's the research center. So the, our primary focus of work over the, the upcoming year um, in extracted features, we had a recent release of extracted features over 13.6 million volumes, close to the total uh, number of, of volumes in, in Hathi Trust. For the web interface, uh, <clears throat> We've got, a, uh, we've got Bookworm being added as a, as a uh, user interface um, analysis, visual analysis tool to accessing the content. Uh, here I mentioned the work set, so the, uh, there's work going on, on on an improved work set, which is again is the research context, and then there's improvements on the data capsule so that it can shift from being um, from accessing the what was the public domain content to, sh to the in copyright content, which is something that we received about, it's been about nine months ago now. So those can be summarized as follows. The, the web interface, uh, you know, the works, the one accesses the canned algorithms, which are inspired by Monk, um, access to the data capsule, bookworm extracted features are all 
done through the through the uh, interface, and that's again we have to know who you are for for the auditing purposes. We need to implement uh, the data capsule. In the data capsule, one runs your own algorithms, um, accessing the data directly, but it's it's in a controlled and secured environment to protect the copyrighted content. And then the extracted feature said 13.7 million. My apologies, um, and it was released in November. So what you know? So with respect, that was more on a technical. What we're doing technically, um, you know, what we're doing as a center as a whole for 2017 um, effort, um, growing demand. Uh, we've gotten what we think is is you know, considerable um, interest and uptake in, in the digital humanities, um, less so in, in um, other uh, domains. Uh, we think there is a compelling interest in uh, social sciences. Uh, we think, you know, stimulating that need is, is you know, something we'll have a question for you on. Um, it's something that I think we have to do in Hathi Trust as a whole, things like better characterizing and describing our federal documents. I think is, is these kinds of steps have to, have to be done before social scientists, uh, given the way they look at content to analyze, are comfortable knowing that what they're dealing with is what they want to, to, to research. I think so we have some work to do, both in terms of you know, stimulating the computational need, but also uh, putting the, the conceptual uh, organization in place so that social scientists know what's there um, and can grapple with it in the way they think about it. And, and lowering barriers to use. Um, you know, someone who comes in and does research with us um, should, <laughs> there should be an efficient process from the time they submit, most of our, our interest comes in through our ACS program, which Stephen will, will talk about. From the moment they get an approved um, Advanced Collaborative Support Award until they get their results, that whole process needs to be made more efficient than it is right now. There are stalls in that process that we need to work on. So when I say lowering our barriers to news, it's, it's not just you know, the, the human computer interface to our tools, it's making sure that our processes as a center are as efficient as possible so that we're not impeding a research process. Again, we, there's, there's work that needs to be done. And this needs to be done not only for, you know, a, what we, we're char canonically characterizing the, the, the researcher with small needs, which is a thousand volumes or less, and the researcher with large needs, which is a million volumes uh, around that. That's how we're characterizing for both of those uh, canonical groups. And then finally, the, and this is for all three use modes, and that, that's the pictorial diagram that I gave you, the, the web tools, the extractive features, and the data capsule. And then finally, we're, we're engaging in partner op partnering opportunities. I won't say much about that uh, because uh, uh, John will talk about that. But the last item there is uh, developing a cost model for, for in-kind contributions. And, and when I say contributions, it's not like anybody's, you know, Throwing, throwing resources at at Hadi Trust as, as a whole, but but how can you know how can Hadi Trust and, and the research center take advantage of resources as they exist at other institutions? And I'm thinking compute resources is the most obvious, um, so that we become more of a community community uh, sustained organization over time. And that's a that's a, that's a I think an important aspect for sustainability. And then finally, uh, some of this work is, is being done through a, uh, a grant from the, a generous grant from the Mellon Foundation uh, where we are enhancing the works at Builder. It's, it's, it's now a, a linked data uh, representation with a, a search interface that is much better than what we had before. Um, and it's using solar on the back end. And then we're working on um, deeper integration of that work set in and out of uh, the data capsule, particularly for the, the large scale data, um, with a focus on both digital humanities and linguistics, uh, computational linguistics, and working on the in copyright content. So those, I think, are, are, are critical uh, steps for the, um, for both the work set and the, and the data capsule. So I'll leave it at that and turn this over to um, Stephen Downey. So Stephen? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Okay.
Good morning, everyone, um, and thanks. Thank you very much for uh, coming today. Um, what I want to speak to next is some of the realization of what is happening. So we have the we have the data, marvelous data. We have the hardware. We have the networks, the systems, the staff in place. So what is the outcome uh, of some of this? And one program that we have, it's an ongoing uh, perpetual program that we have as part of the research center. It's called Advanced Collaborative Support. Um, and this is us reaching out to the community and providing resources, man, uh, person power, compute power, the data, to help stimulate and uh, prototype classic digital humanities text data mining projects. Um, we've been running it as a, a series, a, short series of um, peer-reviewed kind of uh, submissions uh, where we get applications where an RFP goes out and then um, small proposals, about seven or eight pages with the research question uh, are, are submitted to us and we review them. And then we assign a, a staff programmer some, and staff librarians, whatever the, the proper set of facilities and personnel to help them prototype their project. Um, and so uh, in round one, uh, in 2015, we had these various uh, projects that were, took place. So we had detecting literary plagiarism, the case of Oliver Goldsmith. Um, so analyzing the text to see whether the text data mining algorithms could actually detect uh, where uh, our hero, uh, Oliver Goldsmith, actually lifted his, uh, his text. He was famous for it, and actually he was famous for doing it across languages, which is really kind of an interesting plagiarism problem. Um, then we have literary uh, geography at scale, uh, Matthew Wilkins at Notre Dame. One thing I'm really proud of this um, is that that little project was flipped into an NEH grant, which is now a long-term uh, research project of Professor Wilkins. Um, then we had at Indiana University a marvelous uh, study on how to look at the topics inside books, not on the outside, on the inside of the literature, so we get finer grade topic modeling of the literature. I, I found that really exciting. A group of, uh, of, a very wide group of folks, mostly from Canada, led by our Canadian friends, um, uh, trace a theory, looking at the evolution of the notion of theory in the literature, and then tracking technology diffusion over time uh, with uh, Michelle uh, Alexopoulos, who's actually an economist, and looking at uh, the notion of steam power and how that got talked about from its inception to now, and it's a really fascinating, very worthwhile study using the resources that we have in this fantastic collection. So one thing, if you're interested in these projects, we do have a, up here these vignettes. So one of them, uh, they're all describing some of these projects. We invite you to come and uh, take them with you. So the ACS projects for round two, uh, we're now uh, looking at some other uh, uh, research going on. Um, we have a, a scholar right now looking at the notion of uh, yellow fever uh, in the Caribbean and finding all the texts to discuss the notion of sanitation and uh, the confluence of uh, yellow fever. Then we have uh, someone is tracing the history of creativity, and that's at Brown. Then we have a PhD student, actually, uh, as part of their thesis work, trying to figure out uh, what was the influence of the Chicago School of uh, architecture um, and finding that examples of that from the literature. And then finally, I think one of the more fun ones is the signal uh, to noise uh, uh, study where they're comparing, comparing texts, romantic texts, uh, Walter Scott versus Jane Austen uh, and looking for stylistic differences and similarities between those two. And those are ongoing right now. And we'll be having another RFP uh, in the new year uh, to take advantage of our, uh, in, more of our in-copyright data. So um, we will spam the usual lists and reach out to your, your uh, organizations because we are interested in, in helping the community as best we can. So part of this outreach, uh, which is really important. So we've talked about the, the notion of technologies and data capsules and web portals and, and big disk and big data. One thing I'm really proud of uh, coming from the, the former graduate school of library and information science and now the school of information sciences at Illinois, I have a proud library tradition. And we really and truly believe that one of our more important interfaces is the library writ large. Um, it's going beyond just the technology, it's actually the outreach represented by the librarians, uh, active librarians in our various institutions. So we, uh, we work closely with scholarly commons and digital humanities centers to create these outreach programs. 
And we do a lot of uh, user needs assessment uh, with gathering information from folks, some of you, actually we've talked to in this room, um, to find out what your users and what your clients are actually needing, what, where are the gaps that we can fill. Um, we've done, uh, we're looking at uh, social sciences, we've done a, a stronger, we have a stronger background in digital humanities and now we're reaching out to our social science communities. Um, and also we are looking uh, to train librarians, train um, staff in our various tools, whether it be the portal, whether it be our, our thing that we call the Workset Builder, whether we call it Bookworm. Uh, Bookworm is a very fun tool to use. The data capsule, and actually in reaching those communities at the right level. So whether it's an undergrad, uh, beginner to a PhD advanced uh, person, we have, we're targeting tailor-made uh, outreach programs through the Scholarly Commons. One of our uh, great sort of outreach uh, endeavors right now is being funded by the uh, IMLS. It's being led by Harriet Green at uh, Illinois. And the one thing I really, uh, really like about this, because it, it puts the rubber on the road, so to speak. It is uh, digging deeper, reaching further, libraries empowering users to mine the Hardy Trust Digital Library. Um, it's a nice mix of uh, participatory uh, institutions. So we have large-scale institutions, Indiana, Illinois, North Carolina, Northwestern, and then we get into smaller institutions, uh, for example, Lafayette College. And it's a train-the-trainer program. Uh, we will be probably reaching out to some of you in the very near future to start placing some of our train-the-training programs in your institutions, uh, and they do a fantastic job. And we have two more years, is that correct, uh, Robert, on the... And Beth, yeah, two more years. Uh, so we're now we're ramping up, and we'll be reaching out to you uh, and your your various communities to get your staff uh, more familiar to be the interface for the Hadi Trust Research Center. And it's at that point now I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to John Osworth. Thanks, Stephen. Good morning. So my unofficial title at the Hathi Trust Research Center is Chief Schmoozing Officer, CSO. Um, and I'm in charge of uh, finding us partnerships and, and building those into uh, something that makes the Hathi Trust Research Center sustainable. Um, this has been something that I've been thinking about since I started working on this project uh, back in 2008 because it's obvious that running this kind of infrastructure has some significant fixed costs and that you know, while we could recover some of those through uh, partnership with the Hathi Trust and uh, deriving some income from membership fees, we could also uh, recover some of these uh, from partnerships with researchers and getting some of our costs written into grant budgets, that beyond that we still needed something more uh, that would just be a predictable uh, source of support for the, for the enterprise. So that's one dimension of partnerships. Uh, another dimension of partnerships is that if we're successful in what we're doing in the HTRC, I think uh, we will develop an, app, uh, uh, an environment in which researchers partner with each other and collaborate. And you know, part of what we're thinking about is how to build support for data communities and for uh, the work that they do and the tools that they use. Um, the data capsule already envisions bringing tools from outside communities into our computational environment and trying to do that in a secure way. Um, and I don't think that the only people who might be interested in putting uh, tools in this environment are other universities. And clearly we're already seeing publishers developing these tools and I think shifting their notion of their business uh, in some quarters of scholarly publishing at least uh, away from the production of content and towards the production of research services and platforms. Um, so I actually see the, the HTRC as a potential uh, inflection point for this change that's coming and maybe the best case for the scholarly community to uh, change the balance of power here a little bit. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. Um, if you're doing text mining, uh, it's much better to have everything that you're interested in mining in one place. 
It's difficult to do distributed text mining and get results from here and results from here and results from here using uh, you know, data that might be a little bit differently prepared and tools that might operate a little bit differently in different environments and aggregate those results and be confident that what you're getting is what you thought you got. So co-located co content certainly makes it easier for researchers and arguably produces better results. Um, there is a, um, a study, uh, the first part of uh, some consulting that I'm commissioning on this subject, just came in on December 7th from uh, Tony Tracy. Tony uh, worked for Portico for a long time and is a publishing consultant now. And she's uh, working with us on doing a sort of survey of the text data mining landscape out there, what's out there now for services, who's offering them, what do they charge for them, you know, what kind of shape do they take. And then she'll be working further with us to do more in-depth conversations with libraries and with publishers about uh, how, how they think services in this area should develop. The business case for publishers uh, for co-locating content with the HTRC is not, I think, particularly difficult to make. A lot of publishers now, as Tony's study shows, are preparing data sets for researchers and in some cases charging, but they don't post prices so you can't tell exactly what they're charging, uh, but they do sometimes um, charge for assembling those data sets. And even that probably doesn't cover their costs because they're taking people off of other jobs, pulling these data sets by hand, um, and then they ship the data sets to the researchers, I'm sure with an agreement that says that the researcher will destroy the data once the research is done, and there's no enforcement of that. Uh, so they have no real surety that uh, you know, their data once shipped uh, will be used as it's supposed to, and whatever's done with it is invisible to them unless results are published in some journal at the end of the process. So I think we can offer a better business proposition in HTRC in a secure environment uh, where what researchers do with their content is audited and, and visible to the people who provide the content, where uh, an 18th century researcher, let's say, would have access not only to the 18th century data sets that the publisher provides, but to uh, literally millions of pages of 18th century literature, which is uh, in many cases, um, well, the 18th century primary literature, no, but uh, 18th century scholarship in copyright and uh, unavailable to those publishers through licensing schemes. So I think uh, we have a, a case that's makeable to publishers that it would be in their interest to, to participate. The business case for libraries is an interesting one. Um, uh, Brendan Butler, who works for me at the University of Virginia Library, uh, makes a strong case that uh, li when libraries license content, they license the right to text mine that content. Um, and I believe that he's correct. Um, he argues against specifically negotiating that right because uh, that gives it the status of something that might be in question. Um, but I think the case for libraries begins with what happens when you get the data set and you hand it to the researcher. If the researcher is capable of taking it from there, then maybe that's fine. Um, but as we see more of this work being done in newly data-centric disciplines, in the humanities and the social sciences, I think that's not gonna be the case, and I think the business case for libraries is about support. Um, if you hand a data set to a researcher they, and they don't know what to do with it, they will be back on your doorstep shortly. Um, so we're, we're looking at this set of issues in the context of a pilot project, uh, which we've been discussing since the last CNI, where the discussion began, um, with Portico and JSTOR, uh, and the idea is to uh, get some of the publishers that they work with uh, to agree to co-locate some content in the secure environment uh, that we run and to have us look at uh, what kinds of issues are raised by trying to normalize data across these different streams and by trying to uh, bring tools to bear that may have been developed outside our environment. Um, so that, that work is underway now. Um, the great advantage of working with JSTOR and Portico on a pilot such as this is that they already aggregate publisher relationships. So they have agreements with lots of publishers. They know those people. They, they have a trust relationship. It's much easier for us to work with them as partners than to try to establish relationships with each of these publishers. And I think it gives us a, a way to talk to publishers uh, about sustainability strategies in a larger context of uh, 
there are other business relationships. And finally, uh, I think in this pilot, what we're looking at is, you know, if we do think that this in the future will be an environment where people outside Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan are bringing tools to bear, uh, what do we do in terms of APIs, in terms of uh, some of the fundamental affordances like the Workset Builder to make this a level playing field uh, so that the best tools can rise to the top, which again I think would be in the interest of scholars. Uh, so those are some future challenges that we're looking at. Um, we have some other known future challenges. Uh, I think uh, competing and collaborating in a mixed for-profit, non-profit environment is definitely uh, right up there, and that's, you know, we'll be cautiously looking, you know, at the dimensions of that in this pilot. Uh, building robust data communities, I mentioned that earlier as a goal. Uh, discovery services for work sets and results, part of collaborating in this environment will be understanding what other people have already done there and whether it would be of use to you um, or whether you need to start over. Uh, contributing improved machine-readable text to the Hathi Trust itself, as a lot of work gets done on the text in this environment, and in many cases that text will be improved. This has been a known issue since we started talking about this. There really isn't, at this point, a way to feed that back upstream to the Hathi Trust. It's not a technical problem. Um, it's it's a, a sequencing or editorial problem. Um, and finally, uh, the vetting of research results. Right now, research results coming from the copyrighted data are human reviewed to make sure that we're not releasing uh, text that could be uh, large enough to constitute uh, a conflict uh, with the copyright situation. There, I'm sure that there are ways to do some, if not all, of this review computationally. I think that's a problem in cryptography, basically. I think the question is, can this particular data set be reverse engineered into the text that it came from? And uh, I'm betting that there are some computational solutions to, to that problem. Um, we invite you to get in touch. There's an email address up at the top of the box there. Uh, we invite you to get involved. Uh, keep an eye out for the next advanced collaborative support call. Share that with your researchers. Help us identify. Uh, especially social science researchers at this point with an interest in the Hathi Trust and encourage your users to join the monthly user group meeting. And last but not least, thanks to our sponsors. And I think at this point I'm turning it over to the mic at the end for discussion.